Welcome, welcome to Edinburgh, should have been the title of my talk because I'm going to talk about the city I love. The city I have been passionate in love with since I came here as a student. A city that its creativity and its curiosity and its culture and its citizens make for a passionate love affair. But I'm not the only one that is in love with Edinburgh. In fact, the City Council, as it does every year this year, did one of its surveys. It talks to the citizens about what's going on and how they feel about the place and all the different services going on. And it asks them how they feel about the city. And 94%, 94% of citizens of Edinburgh said they love living in the city. That's an extraordinary number of citizens to say such positive th things about the city they live in. So I'm not alone. There are many people who love this city. I fell in love with this city when I came here to be a student in about 1843 or whenever it was. <laughs> Way back when. And then it was just, just the people and the places and the things to do. It's a fantastic place to be a student. And I know that many are students here today and you love being in this city too because the opportunities that it creates for you. Yes, I love this city. I love the fact that I now live 10 minutes from the seaside and 10 minutes from the city centre. 10 minutes from Portobello, 10 minutes from the the city centre. This is an international capital city and you can be that close to the sea and the centre. I love the fact that we have these incredible festivals, 12 of them, and in the summer when the population of this city literally doubles, that culture is right in your face. You see some extraordinary sights, including this gorgeous man in his tutu. <laughs> And then the Hogmanay Bash, for those of you not from Scotland, that's New Year Party, uh, where throughout the world, people know the place to be at 12 o'clock on the 31st of December is here in Edinburgh. And I really love that. I love the fact that this is where the, Sc the, Enlightenment, the Scottish Enlightenment began, where we learn to be curious and to be sceptical and to question things and to see the world in a different way and to use reason and passion and empirical evidence and combine all those things to understand how we are together as human beings in a very different way that gave us liberal democracy across huge swathes of the world. I love the fact that when you come out of Waverley Station, the first thing you see is the largest monument to an author in the world. What does that tell you about this city and its passion, the Scott Monument. And then we gather that together in a festival of storytelling where we gather all the ideas we have and the tales to tell and our histories and our passions and we celebrate them in storytelling. And then we have a festival to science, the largest science festival in the world, here in this city, where we take all that creativity and all that extraordinary knowledge and we ask the question, not just what have we got, but what might we do? It's an incredible place to be and a city to love. And I love the fact that there are many schools in this city with more than 25 first languages. It is a global city here in Scotland celebrating diversity and difference in everyday life. It's extraordinary. And I love the fact that in the Royal Mile there are seven centuries of architecture in fact, even further, if you go under Edinburgh Castle and you find the Bronze Age settlements there, seven centuries of architecture, the story of the city held in its walls. Held, but still changing and still being rewritten. And I love to stand high up on Carlton Hill on the mound at dusk and look out over the city and you see the castle and you see the fourth and you see the lights and the culture and the place. It is a great place to be a father and a husband and a citizen. So I love this city. But there are things about this city that I do not love. I don't love the fact that 21% of the children in this city live in poverty. That, to me, is a moral injustice that needs to be challenged. And I don't love the fact that 70% of those families living in poverty have somebody working. Here we are in a world-famous international capital creating enormous quantities of wealth, not just for our nation, but across the globe. And yet, the inequality gap between that 
and those families living in poverty is a scandal. And I don't love the fact that 2,000 individuals last year slept rough at least once on our streets. And every night, tonight included, several hundred will see, sleep rough on the streets and in graveyards and in empty buildings and all the other places where they find a little bit of maybe shelter in this city of ours. And I don't love the fact that 8%, that's around 250 young people every year, leave school with nothing to go to. No positive destination, no job, no training, no further education. 250, that is way, way too many. And I don't love the fact that in amongst those incredible green lungs of the city, you know, 40% of this city is green space with Arthur Seat and Hollywood Park and Princess Street Gardens and Brunsfield Links and down in Leith Links and all those kinds of places. And yet we still have some of the most polluted streets in our nation. And I don't love the fact that thousands, thousands of, literally thousands of families still live in unstable and un uh, unsuitable housing in our city. There are many things about this city that I love, but there are many things that I struggle with. <coughs> and I struggle with the fact that the number of families in the city affected by addiction is growing year on year, feeling more and more excluded from the city that we love. This is a great city, but there's a significant number of people who live in this city who do not feel loved, lovable, or that their love can be received. Now let me tell you about one of them, a young woman called Chloe. Now Chloe um, was 15 and she was really struggling at school. She came from a real tough reality where things for a whole number of reasons were causing her to really struggle to make the best of who she was. So she was refusing school, things were going really badly. So she came to Sirenian's Key to Potential program, which is a program of mentoring, where we just journey with folk and try and work out is what they want to do. Because Chloe's challenge was, it wasn't that she didn't have any ambition, she didn't know how to have ambition. She didn't know how she could, she didn't believe she was able to have an ambition. So she was really struggling in herself. So we gave her some mentoring and created some opportunities for her to see who she was and how she could work. Now, she was struggling with mental health issues. That's another issue that one in four people will struggle with, but we're not very good about talking about. Really, this was just about human relationships. It wasn't rocket science. It was simply somebody giving her time. Well, let, let's Chloe tell you what happened next. <laughs> Company. After 
after Mark left Mark, um, everything he taught me about gaining confidence, where to look in order to get different placements, just the fun, the laughs, but also the seriousness of building CVs, it was a brilliant help. So Chloe's gone on a journey from a tough place to a good place. She made those changes herself. It was her that in that placement, working with people with learning difficulties, she realised that she had something to give and that she could use that talent she does have for designing games for folks she perceived to have things less than she did. And that transformation, that inner journey that she took, was hers and it has really worked for her. And Mark, my colleague, simply journeyed with her in that place. And that's great. But Chloe did something else in that story. She raised what I believe is a revolutionary idea about how things can work for change for folk like her and many others in this city. Remember what she said there? She said, I want to run my own business with these games. Now, she'd been on a journey with us as a charity, and that was great, and we were in a position to help us, help her, because that's what we do. But she had concluded that the best way of achieving her ambition to do good was to set up her business. She understood that she could run a business for social good. For her, that was the best way of achieving it. And I absolutely agree with her. Because it's not only charities that can do good. We just need to be brave enough to see that. The trouble is that this city, like many, many other cities, has a conceptual division set in it. So you've got the private sector, they're the ones that make all the money and just concerned about the bottom line and that's all that matters to them, allegedly. And the public sector, which is full of bureaucracy and that's where they spend the taxes and it's all politics and it seems to be disconnected somehow from the citizens who put them there. And then there's the, pri the, the charitable sector, where they do lots of good stuff for folk and maybe animals and all the rest of it, but they don't really live in the real world. That's a generalise. But these conceptions divide the city instead of finding the way in which the citizens who work in these different areas, and they are simply legal descriptions of the status of those organisations, nothing to do with the actual people who live there. Those citizens are all people like you and I, who part of your family, live in your street, live in your communities, part of the city. If we can find sense of common purpose, rather than dividing ourselves up and assuming that if you work there rather than there, you can never work together. If we could change that, we could harness incredible energy for this city. That's what Chloe saw, and that's what I would like to see happen more and more. And I see it myself, my own life. I work for a charity. My wife works for the city council, the public sector. My brother works for the Royal Bank of Scotland. We're a family. We share the same values. We have the same sense of purpose. The legal status of our employers is frankly irrelevant, but we let that get in the way far too often in our sense of short search for change. But it doesn't have to be like that, and there are people doing things that are making a difference. So the Grass Market Project, it works with some of the most excluded in the city, down in the grass market, it's a social enterprise, and it runs a, wood, a woodworking workshop, it makes kilts quite extraordinarily, it has its own tart and sells them all over the world, and runs a cafe. And it really provides an opportunity for training and change and hope and help for folk who, who uh, struggle with addictions, with real complex challenges and needs. And it does it really well. But the trouble was the cafe, which is one of the biggest sources of income, was really struggling during the winter. They weren't getting the footfall. And they looked out and they saw these tourist companies doing walking tours of the city, this great city. Lots of people come here and want to find out about it and how great it is. And so they said, we can make a connection here. So they went to those companies and said, look, would you... You know, you, you stop off for coffee and stuff in your tours. Why don't you come here? Because if you come to our cafe, you'll do more than get a cup of coffee. You'll be able to say to the people, your customers, who pay for tickets to do the tours, something about the values you have as a company and the values of the city that you're uh, charging them to tour. It'll be something different, and we'll get an income stream. And so the conversation moved from, how can we get a cup of coffee, to how... That the choice we make about the coffee we buy will help us build the city. And that becomes a very different, far more sustainable, values-led relationship between two organisations who are building blocks 
of the city were part of. So Sandlemans agreed to do that, and it's changed both the grass market project's income stream and the work they're able to do, and Sandlemans offer to those who they see as potential customers. It's a win-win for both of them. And then the Rock Trust. The Rock Trust work with 16 to 25 year old homeless folk, really vulnerable young people searching for a way forward as they struggle to flourish because of the, the journey they've been on so far in their lives. And they do so providing accommodation. There's about 50, about 40, about 40 room, um, flats they have across the city and it's supported accommodation. And they need to maintain that. So they went to DJ Alexander, who are a property management company, said, could you help us maintain our property? That seems like a reasonable thing to do. But they began to talk and saw there was another opportunity in there. Because, of course, DJ Alexander have property maintenance teams, folk whose job it is to do the electrics and the painting and the plumbing and all that stuff of property maintenance, as, long, as well as the finance. They said, what if we created a wee academy? So the folk who live in these flats and the Rock Trust look after could get the opportunity to learn how to do property maintenance. And actually, DJ Alexander begin to employ them so that they've got an opportunity for a new education and a new training, a qualification and a job, and learn skills that will help them maintain tenancies when they move on from the Rock Trust. So the Rock Trust have a new pathway for the folk they're caring for and journeying with. And DJ Alexander's staff know that their organisation, their employers, care about much more than the bottom line. They're making choices about how they do their business that open doorways for folk who are excluded from being the citizens we all want to be. That sense of purpose about an organisation is an extraordinary motivator for employees of, the, uh, of DJ Alexander. And so there's a change in the relationship, changes the way that everybody in that story participates as citizens in the city. And Cyrenians, my own organisation, run a farm out, out in West Lothian. And we have a group of young homeless people live on the farm, they work on the farm, we sell the vegetables as part of the way of creating an income stream for us to do more good. And Mark Greenaway is a renowned chef who runs two exclusive restaurants in Edinburgh. Now through conversation we've got to know Mark and he's now chosen to buy products for his restaurant from our farm. Now we have to produce a quality product, that's the challenge for us. But that's not a bad thing, saying to us that quality matters is a good thing for us as an organisation. And he, when he puts a plate in front of one of his customers, is not saying, here's some good food. But here's food. The food in this plate is chosen for the good of the city. And it changes the relationship he has with his customers. Because they understand the values he has as a businessman. And their eyes are open to a different way of seeing the city. And how we might build the city for all its citizens. There are choices made, thousands and thousands of choices made, every single day in businesses and charities across, the, across this city. And they're made for a whole variety of reasons with a whole variety of drivers. But if we can get to the point where there are people are making those choices saying, how can the choice we make, whatever it is, what we buy, who we source, who we contract with, what we say about the contracts we have, all those things can be filtered through the idea of how do we build the city? and how do we build the city for the citizens, all of the citizens, then we find ourselves in a very different place for everybody who are part of this city. And you have a chance to contribute to that. Because if you can challenge those that you buy things from as customers, as, as members of this community, and say, how is it that you relate when you go to businesses, to charities? Is it about just raising money? No, raising money's great, a wee check's fantastic. But actually these real, long-term, sustainable relationships built on building the city are far more powerful and make far more difference than simply the raising of cash in a short-term way. And if you can ask the question of that of the businesses you're participants in, and you, you, you buy things from as customers, as consumers, then you can help make that difference. And if you can do the same to the charitable sector and saying, when you support a charity, how do you relate to business? Are you fear of it? Are you scared of it? Or do you reach out to it to find a new way of doing relationships? And if we can get to that point where we're a city of citizens caring for each other, not a city of citizens divided up into three different types of legal entity, then the chances for the Chloe's of this world to flourish as we would want to flourish will be greatly increased. And so the number of people who feel loved and lovable in the city that we love will change 
incrementally and forever. Thank you.